Hey folks, I'm Gene Della Sala with Audioholics, and today we are here in Miramar, Florida at JL Audio. We flew in Nick Ames, the DSP wizard of JL Audio. How you doing, my friend? I'm doing good. Appreciate you coming here to help me with a project I've been working on. It seems like, what, a year and a half, two years? I've been trying to get the audio system in my two series tuned up. We ran into a couple of snags here or there. Just to give you guys a quick history, if you haven't been following these series of videos on my car tuning, the first video I did, I was talking about gutting the audio system in the 2 Series BMW because quite frankly, the stock system was subpar. It did not keep up with the driving dynamics of the car. Let's just put it that way. So I initially ordered one with a Harman system I was gonna take out. I wasn't 100% happy with that Harman system simply because they didn't put any Logic 7 processing in that system. It was just basically a stereo system with left plus right mixed to the center. So since I got a second series uh, BMW because of the accident we dealt with before, I ordered that one with the stock system without the Harman system just to hear um, you know, how good or how bad it was. And I have to give credit to Harman that the Harman system is a significant upgrade to the stock system, but I still was not happy regardless. So I worked with the guys at Music Car over in Oregon and they spec in a system using Morel drivers, components up front, coax in the back, and Genhurt underseat woofers, the eight inch drivers. And then that's where you guys come in because we got a XD600 slash six, six channel class D amplifier that's rated at I think 75 watts times six at four ohms. It's also bridgeable, but we're actually using all of them as um, unbridged channels. And then the most important tweak in the car is literally called the tweak 88 it's your dsp it's the brains of the whole system it's something that i've never really um thought about in the past of how important it is to properly tune a car with dsp that's where that product comes in and that's where you come in right. and we could talk a little bit about the whole process of where we're at now yeah um so you brought the vehicle to us um for the sound system tuning portion and um, basically what we did was uh, we just look at uh, system tuning as, as kind of a simple equation of there's three parameters that are really important. There's frequency, time, and level, right? Right. And these are the same three parameters that just about any DSP gives you adjustment over, frequency, time, and level. So when we're making the adjustments to a, to a sound system, and this is, you know, applies in both cars or home or studio or whatever, um, those are the three things that you have to focus on and, and balance against each other and optimize. Right. So um, the tools that, that we use uh, basically are an analysis system that lets us investigate those three things, frequency, time, and level. So um, we basically adjust um, the individual responses that we have control over um, against a known target. And once we get all the responses adjusted um, against a known target in both frequency and time, uh, then we play the system, get in and listen, and make some key by ear adjustments from there. And generally, it, once once you've done the, once you've followed that formula, um, it's it usually sounds much better than most people are used to hearing. Well, that's why I want to step back a little bit before we get into all that nitty gritty, is when you talk about a target curve, the one thing I noticed, and I just started looking into car audio, it's not something I paid a lot of focus on with Audioholics over our 18 year history, but I am going to start looking at in more depth, is there almost seems to be no standards in the industry, at least in the aftermarket OEM world. When you want to gut a system and put a new system in, nobody's really following any target curve. What I've found is most of the install companies I've been looking at is they use an RTA, right? And they do frequency domain correction and usually at a single microphone position. And that can only get you so far. I know when I got the system installed, the guys that did the actual install for my car did an amazing job. They, they made the car look as if it was untouched. It's not the old days where you have these giant woofers hanging out of the back seat or anything like that. The guys at Maximum AV did an amazing job in Tampa in getting the system integrated into my car so it looks stock but I wanted to take it to the next level and I wanted to get into DSP processing that could really take advantage of good components. Because let's face it, you could put the best equipment in a car or in a home. And if you don't properly calibrate or EQ it, it's out the window. It's you're better off just not even changing the equipment. So what I wanted to talk to you about is what have you guys found in your research in terms of a good target curve as a starting point? What is a target curve? 
And what did you guys come up with when you started tuning the car based on that target curve? Um, well, a, a target curve is, there's a couple different different ways you can think about it. The, the target curve that we can show and talk about here right now is basically just a full range response of the finished system. Mm -hmm. So all active or passive components all playing at once, you know, um, and then it's, it's more or less how the spectral content or spectral balance of the system um, that we're aiming for. So, um, you know, generally there's a, there's a rise in the, in the low frequency response mm -hmm. um, relative to the high frequency. Um, sometimes there's a little bit of a, a, a drop um, in this kind of 2 to 4K region. Well, your ears are more sensitive um, in that area too. Yeah, yeah. And uh, this particular curve that we have here is, is something that has kind of evolved over time. Um, but in addition to this curve is there's, you know, there's also these responses here. There's the, you know, so there's this, there's this subwoofer response, right? There's a subwoofer response and that, so that guy by himself when when we're tuning the individual drivers that guy has his own target as well you know right. and so there's multiple targets but in the end the overall response is you know you want to follow some sort of predefined formula and and it's not extremely critical that you try to follow it to a t because it depends on the analysis system that you're using and the level of smoothing and all that stuff you can you know you can make a response look almost picture perfect but really that's yeah. you you miss so much valuable detail that um it's a mistake to overly smooth traces for anybody out there that yeah so i mean when you're doing your measurements you're doing at least one twelfth octave resolution right um well one yeah what we what we tend to use is um a a smoothing factor which is slightly different than you would think of as like rta banding right um but yes at least one twelfth octave um, resolution I would I would I would highly recommend because you then you can you can really start to see the interaction of the different drivers yes. whenever you play them individually and then play them summed and see how they interact it's pretty important the other thing I want to talk to you about too is this is something else I've noticed in the OEM business is a lot of cars if they don't do post-processing whether it's ProLogic 2 up mixing or if it's Harman's has Logic 7 I've seen a lot of them just basically dump left and right into the center channel into the center console of your car mm -hmm. And then just have left and right for the uh, front speakers and left and right for the back speakers. And in my opinion, what that does is it actually collapses your sound stage because now you're putting, especially if you're not level controlling that center channel, most cars don't give you level control. They'll do equal level on all speakers. And you can hear it right away. Everything just focuses into the center channel. And if you can't turn that off or manipulate it with DSP or level control, it kind of really... They're trying to give everybody a good seat when in reality you're giving everybody a mediocre seat. So in the case of the two series, it's such a small cabin especially, you really, in my opinion, don't need a center channel when you're doing single seat tuning because you're getting a great phantom image to begin with. Right. And if you can do multiple tunes for the driver and the passenger and then have a general tune for all listeners, you really sh shouldn't need that center channel, or if you are going to do a center channel, you should do some type of DSP to it. What are your thoughts about that? Um, well, I think that originally in, in the OEM world, the idea behind the center speaker was to give both front seat occupants the same sound image experience at the same time. So instead of um, changing presets, right, they wanted both both people to be able to experience uh, basically the same sound stage, right? and um, with, with good center imaging and good spatial width and that kind of thing. Um, and when done properly, like you mentioned, when, when properly processed, um, the left-right signal is turned into a, a, new, a new reality, which is uh, left-center-right. Mm -hmm. And the L in LCR isn't the same as the L in LR. Gotcha. And, and same with the R part, right? Even it, That's changed as well when done properly. That's not just left alone and, and, and summed to create center. These, these left and rights, they're now different too. Right. You know, so, um, so yeah, if there's manufacturers out there, which I believe there are, we discussed this before. Um, yeah, just summing L and R and sending it to a center, that's, I think that's a way to try to um, maybe sell your car because you can say we too have a center channel, but it doesn't necessarily. <laughs> More is better, right? Yeah, it doesn't equate necessarily yeah. to a good, um, you know, to a good sonic experience for the listeners necessarily, but when done properly, it can. You know, when done right. properly, it can. Um, but that that's, yeah, that's. That's the goal, I think, is to give both front seat occupants um, the same experience at the same time. But in our situation where we don't have post-processing up mixing, 
Right. It's really best to just disable that center channel altogether. Yeah. 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 Especially if you're if if the owner of the vehicle, like in your case, if you're willing and and want to switch presets, if that's okay, right? Mm -hmm. Which it's a very worthy compromise in my opinion because um, with any system, whether it's a car or a pro audio or a home or whatever, um, the, just the law of, law of physics dictates that um, a single point in space is going to be the most optimized. Right. right now, whether people like to hear that or not is a completely different matter, but it doesn't change reality. The reality is you can optimize a sound system at a single point in space better than you can at a multiple points in space. Sure. It's Some people money don't seat. like that reality, but it, yeah. it is true. It's the money seat, basically. Yeah. So in our case, we don't have post-processing going on. We disable the center channel. A lot of guys that own the 2 Series I've, I've seen on the forums, that's the first tweak they do when they get the stock systems. They yank the center channel out just because... Like I said, there's no level control on it. But another thing I wanted to talk about, and when I tuned the system myself, I initially tuned the system with by ear. I didn't have a way of measuring. There's no three and a half millimeter input on the system. So if I just stuck a CD in, I would be limited to an RTA function. I wouldn't be able to look at time domain analysis anyways. So I knew I was coming here. I did my best to EQ the system by ear. Um, what I found when I was doing that is by manipulating the delays of the rear channels, which are just stereo, it's the same thing as the front, I couldn't believe the fact that I was able to anchor a center channel image better just by manipulating the phase or the delays of the rear channels. And I think that's a missed opportunity in a lot of car systems when they just dummy it up and do the same signal in the back and they don't manipulate it with DSP. What's your experience with that? Because we've, did, we've done more in this car than just do left and right. You've messed, you've, missed with, you've messed with left minus right, right minus left. Yeah. So tell me that whole process and what you guys have found and why you did that. Yeah. Well, what, what we do when, when we're optimizing for a single seat right, um, is we will leave, well, during the tuning process, we'll treat the rears as if they are another set of loudspeakers that are going to be summed into the main system, right? The main system being front, left, right, and sub. Right. Okay. Um, whatever that front, left, right may be. It could be fully active three-way. It could be a two, whatever. No, just front, left, right, and sub. That's the main system. And then the rears are summed in in frequency and time as if as if they are going to be part of that system. Um, and then what we do is um, oftentimes what we'll do, some, sometimes what we did in your car, is we'll manipulate the signal feeding the rears by subtracting out from that signal any information which is common to both of them. Mm -hmm. Because information which is common to both manifests in our perception as being in front of us, all things being equal. So right. long as the left and right are arriving in, at equal time and equal amplitude, then yeah, then sounds that that, have, that occur on both channels simultaneously that are um, coherent with each other, they manifest in front of us. So if we have those sounds coming from the rear, it tends to pull our awareness backward. And so that, that front sound stage can actually um, be harmed in, the, in that case. Right. So um, what we'll do is... Uh, manipulate that signal by summing the inverse of the opposite side to subtract out center information and then and then send that resulting signal to each speaker. So gotcha. the left gets L minus R and R, uh, right gets R minus L. And, and then all that's left is the real stereo stuff. Yeah, so basically you're getting the stereo information to the rear, but mm -hmm. you're subtracting the common information off of it. Yeah. So you're yeah. not you're not messing up your front sound stage. Right. As a so result. like vocals which tend to be recorded center not always the case right but tend to be um when when you hear them you hear them from in front you don't hear them come from behind gotcha yeah and it works because i could tell you when um in my mix when i did my dsp tuning it was just four channel stereo i manipulated the phase to get a good anchored center channel but when i noticed when you did the l minus r r minus l in the rear it actually expanded the stereo sound stage it actually sounds like the stereo sound stage is wider than the cabin itself. It tends to, yeah. Yeah, it depends on the car, but it's a pretty neat uh, phenomenon when you can pull it off. Gotcha, yeah. So another thing I wanted to talk to you about is when we're looking at these graphs and you're gonna pull up um, the graphs here on, on my car, I think, in my opinion, the most critical range is to get that, the base from the under seat woofers and the mids and tweeters that range where they're crossing over to each other. You gotta right. integrate that in the time domain. Yeah. And it's the same thing in a home theater. You hear a lot of subwoofer satellite systems in a home theater. They don't sound as integrated as if you have a full range tower. And a lot of that has to do with the fact of the phase anomalies that happen at that transition region. Mm -hmm. So why don't you show us what you've done to overcome that so you can make the whole system sound together as one. Yeah, so 
Um, let's see here. We could take a look at some at some phase information. Um, let me let me first. Let's just talk about this first here. Okay. Um, okay. So <clears throat> basically, the we'll take a look at just this one, right? So basically, the the subwoofer's response and the main speaker's response, right? They're they're independent of each other until you play them at the same time. So they're crossed over at around 100 hertz, as you can see, where they're the two lines are meet acoustically. Yeah, where they're it's meeting. A, it's actually yeah. about 140, <clears throat> right here on, on this graph, right? Okay. Acoustically. Now the um, the electrical filter wasn't set to 140 because that's that's just a reality of, of sound systems. The electrical filter does not precisely dictate what the actual acoustic roll off is going to be. And that's right. a mistake sometimes people make is assuming that to be the case. Right. So um, with this particular response, this uh, what we did here was we actually had stronger summation in this region because we had this res we had this um, low pass filter on your subs. We had it actually set a little bit higher, which aligned the phase traces if we take a look at those. Okay, so the phase traces here, you can see that there's a slight misalignment right. between, and I'm not sure if my cursor is, is showing up, but between here and here, there's a slight misalignment there, and that's actually on purpose. When we had that filter setting a little bit higher on the low pass, these phase traces overlaid exactly, and we had very strong summation in this region. Right. But that really strong summation was a little too strong, and so rather than try to um, EQ that, what we did was we just lowered that filter frequency a bit it misaligned the phase just a little we still have summation we don't have cancellation but it misaligned it just a little and it brought that amplitude response down in that crossover region and it really kind of just tightened up the overall so region. in other, so in other words when you had them perfectly phase aligned the mutual coupling between the satellite speakers and the undersea woofers was too much and it was almost yeah. creating a resonance at that area yeah which is yeah. i ran into the same problem i wasn't measuring it but i could hear it and I flipped the phase on those underseat woofers just to kind of mitigate that. Right. And the other thing that should be noted here is the vehicle that we're that we're discussing. It has, it doesn't. This isn't a subwoofer like in the conventional sense of car audio. Like right. Big subwoofer in a box. These are OEM speaker locations under the seat of a BMW. And the next driver up. So these are eight inch. Uh, these are eight inch diameter speakers here. Right. Yes. The next driver up is what three three inches in diameter. It's or something. a big transition. So yeah. we've got a yes, yeah, so yeah. we've got a couple uh, the under seat subs to these small little mid mid range yes. drivers. And so to pull that off and do it well is a bit you know it's a bit tricky. So yeah guys basically those three inch drivers are only good down to about 100 and 125 hertz usable bandwidth in, in terms of getting any dynamic range out of them. So as a result you got to cross over the underseat woofers higher than you would a sub. More, normally you would cross sure. a sub over at say 80 hertz. For sure. So now you're crossing them over at 120, 150 hertz. They become more localized. So if you don't control those resonances and you're sitting close to those subs, you're going to know that that bass is coming from below you. Right, exactly. Yep. And it's amazing the integration that we got and you don't even know it. It actually sounds like a fluid system. Like you have no idea that there's underseat woofers. In it does. Car. Yeah. It's, it's yeah, pretty surprising. Yeah. So I'm really happy with the results here. I don't know if you wanted to talk about anything else in terms of the room correction or the, uh, in the EQ correction that you did here that would uh, add more to the discussion. Um, um, there's, there's maybe a couple things we could, we could point out. I mean, um, Oh, what I wanted to ask you actually, yeah. this is very important. You didn't just measure at one microphone position. You actually let right. me sit in the car. You you marked off where my head is. Right. So we kind of came up with a head related transfer function by having multiple mics to simulate how my hearing is going to hear it as opposed to just a single mic. Because microphones are dumb. They don't integrate like we do. So you have to kind of take an average of that whole area that you're EQing for. Right. That's yeah. That's what we like to do is um, is do a, a spatial average of the listening area and in a single seat tune that would be basically where the where the listener's head's going to be right and um the reason the main reason for that is because individual microphones um depending upon their point in space within the car and and, the, and it can vary just by a small amount you just move it a small amount and you can have drastically different response characteristics mm -hmm. right and so if you're going to use measured magnitude responses um, as a basis for equalization decisions then you want to make sure that what your correcting with your equalization is not position dependent anomalies that would be different had you just bumped the mic a hair right because right? then it's like well how do I even know that what I'm doing is worthwhile right so um, so by averaging all those uh, multiple microphones you remove a lot of that and what you're left with is the overall trend that matters it's the overall response that uh, much more closely relates to what we hear 
And that's more critical at the higher frequencies than the lower frequencies because you're talking, when you're talking bass frequencies, those mic positions become less important. Um, right, yeah, because of the small confines of a vehicle's interior and the large, um, you know, nature Wave of lengths. low wave, of yeah. low frequencies, then yeah, it's kind of in the pressure zone down there, right? You know, the low stuff, but up there in that, you know, upper, especially the mid to upper mid range, um, yeah, the the microphone position makes a massive difference. So averaging is pretty critical. Now, guys, another thing it's important to know, and I know we can't talk about this much yet because there's stuff down the pipe but they did not apply equal weighing to all of the measurements. There's obviously, they have a- To all of the microphone. To all the microphone right. measurements. There's right. a recipe and a reason for what they've done. And hopefully in the future, we can talk more about it. Yeah. But it's very impressive. And I'm, I'm telling you guys that if you get a car system thrown in your car and you're putting in good equipment, you really need to get a good DSP. And you, get a, you need to get someone that knows, that's knowledgeable on how to do these DSP tunings. Because a simple RTA with a frequency domain correction is not going to get you all the way there. Right. And I wanted to talk to you about this new product we have here from JL Audio. Mm -hmm. Now, in my system, we've got the XD600 six channel amp and the, and the Tweak 88. Mm -hmm. I don't remember the name of this, but you're going to tell me that this basically has everything in one box. Right. Yeah. This is, um, this is our VXI line of amplifiers. So this is our new flagship uh -huh. um, for car audio amplifiers. Um, <clears throat> it's basically a six channel, much like the XD. Um, the amplifier uh, section of this is similar to the XD, but a much improved version of it. Um, the DSP in this, um, unlike the Tweak 88, um, is sampling at 96 kilohertz, which some people, that's a big deal to them. Right. Maybe What's the sampling so, rate in the, in the 48 TV? kilohertz. Oh, okay. Yeah. Um, both completely adequate in my opinion. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Um, this has some additional like tricks to oh, do the tuning. There's a lot. <laughs> the all pass filter um, allows you to manipulate um, phase response without adjusting magnitude. Right. right. So the sort the sort of phase response effect that you get from applying, say, a, a fourth order Linkwitz Riley filter, like a high pass or a low pass, mm -hmm. what what you would think of in the phase response, that's what you can apply with an all pass, but without the roll off in the magnitude. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. So it's really, really important in, in car audio. It comes in extremely handy. Um, so yeah, it has the variable all pass filters, um, the delay steps, because it's sampling at 96 K each of your delay steps is exactly half that of the 48 K sample rate. So instead of 0.02 milliseconds per step, it's 0.01. Wow. So it's 10 microseconds per, per step. Um, that's up to about 21 milliseconds of total delay per channel. Mm -hmm. Um, it's also got uh, digital out, which can be routed through the equalization blocks if you choose. So you can apply EQ to the digital output, to the optical output. Gotcha. So the optical is not just a pass through. You can DSP it as well. And what would you plug into the digital out in a, in a system um, like this? In this system, <clears throat> the digital out um, is most beneficial when using multiple amplifiers. Oh, okay. So if you have a network of these amplifiers, they can be networked together. Then you can take, say, your analog source unit might come into this first amp. This might be your master amp. And then the optical out can go into our hub, which is a, a network hub, which allows communication of all these amplifiers together for things like preset switching and volume control. Wow. And then that optical out is then distributed to all the other amps instead of daisy chained through, where every time you daisy chain it through, you have to go through um, additional latency. Right. Every time you do that, going through the hub, you don't, you don't have that additional latency. Gotcha. Well, that sounds like a very powerful product. Too bad that wasn't around when I was doing yeah, my car. <laughs> it, was, it was, yes, it was close to being completed. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm really happy um, with the tune that you did. Um, my wife's happy as well. So we have, basically we have three presets just to recap. We have my tune, which I'm gonna be using 90% of the time, because let's face it, I'm driving the car. And I'm, gonna, I'm all tweaked in. I've got the surround fill from my position. My wife has her passenger tune, same thing, but it's optimized for her. So she gets the best Phantom stereo for her position. And then we've got the general tune, which is for everybody, which the rear speakers now become just stereo, correct? Yes. yes. Okay. That's great. And that actually sounds really good too. So I mean, pretty much every tune sounds great in this car. It's a small car. I'm happy now because I finally have an audio system that keeps up with the driving dynamics of the car. Because oddly, the 2 Series is one of BMW's best driving cars, but it has one of the worst sounding audio systems in it. <laughs> so now we're at least on equal footing. Right. Appreciate you guys with all this help. 
And guys, let us know what you're doing with your uh, car audio system. Are you happy with your OEM system? Does it sound good? What OEM system do you have? Are you looking at gutting your system and doing something like we did here? Give me some feedback down below what you guys are doing, because this is a whole new area for us to discuss. I told Nick he's going to be on the clock with us because he's coming back. We're going to be talking more about this. This stuff is fascinating to me. I love seeing new technology emerge to bring standards into this area of the field that seems to be lacking. So I'm kind of happy that you made my car the guinea pig, that sure. you tested your new calibration process on. I really appreciate that too. So guys, another thing I wanted to tell you about is visit our Patreon page. We're going to give you benefits that you're not going to get as a regular Audioholic subscriber. And um, we're going to give you review snippets. We're going to give you different how-tos and tech tips. And you could also give us feedback on what kind of videos you'd like us to shoot. Well, my friends, it's time for us to head out. I got to go listen to some music. And until next time, keep listening.